And it, I get choked up every time I tell this story because a mother was on the screen and she said, you have no idea what it's like to have a 10-year-old child who you've never heard speak. And the first words he says when he uses this machine are, I love you. And that machine had not just changed their lives, it had changed her emotional connection with her son, it had changed everything about their relationship. And I'll be honest, I had been for a long time a technology skeptic, and it was one of the things that completely and utterly changed my view. The next talk we have today is about how we can take that power of technology and not just use it in lives outside, but we can use it to drive change in all of our schools. We have speaking Liz Sprout, the incredible head of education for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa in Google for Education. She's got more than 15 years experience in education. Prior to moving to Google, she was working in Dubai as a vice president for K-12 for Pearson. And she's gonna talk to us about the fact that you know, so many teachers will tell you they cannot do everything that they need to do within a week. In the UK, 87% of teachers say they can't manage everything within a week. And honestly, I think perhaps the other 13% have been overly optimistic. So her talk today, Driving Effective Technological Change in Schools, will tell us how we can use technology to harness that power. Please welcome to the stage, Liz Sprout. So, 2019 was a challenging year for me, personally. I had some health issues and ended up taking about three months out of, out of work. But as with all periods of challenge, I actually ended up experiencing some really amazing, life-changing moments. And I want to start with one of those. One that sticks in my mind was finding myself in, an, in a meditation class led by a Greek guy called Yanis. Now, Yanis' mantra was slowly, slowly, as much as you can. Now, I like this because oftentimes we fail to deliver on our ambitions because they're unachievable, or they simply overwhelm us. So how many people had a New Year's resolution that they failed to deliver on? Let me see some hands. New Year's resolutions you failed to deliver on. No New Year resolutions at all. <laughs> OK, good. You guys have figured out how not to have a vision. I like that. Or how many people have had a vision for education technology in their school that's failed? Yeah, quite a lot. OK. Well, today, I'm going to give you a gift. You've probably seen these. Can you hold up whether you have one of these so that I can see? OK. This is a gift, but it's not your gift. The gift I'm going to give you is going to last a lot longer than, uh, than our sleep mask. We're going to try to do something in the best arena that, to my knowledge, has never been done before. But in order for it to work, you're going to have to give me your complete, undivided attention. And I'm not going to start until I believe I've got that. And that might involve eyeballing each and every one of you. OK. I think you lot might be with me right now. I need you to sit properly in your seat. Put your feet squarely on the floor. Straighten your back. Relax your shoulders. Take a breath. Wow. I'm sure you need this. I need this moment. I want you to breathe with me. It might be a good time to put this on. If not, you might want to start just relaxing your eyes, letting your eyelids close. 
I want you to breathe with me. So let's take a nice deep breath in and out. Try it with me. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Concentrate on the sound of your breathing. Let the noise of the show drift into the background as you listen to your breath moving evenly in and out. And now I want you to shift your attention to your belly. Think of your stomach. Think of breathing through your stomach. As you do so, imagine a creature. It might be a dog, it could be a dragon, but this is your creature. It's a creature that you feel 100% comfortable with. Keep the image of the creature in your mind's eye. Imagine a place that you go to to relax. Perhaps it's a seat in your garden, perhaps it's a living room. It's far away from your classroom, I imagine. It's far away from the best arena. What does this place look like to you? Try to paint the picture in your mind's eye and imagine yourself there, and you're there with your creature. Now I want you to talk to your creature in your mind and tell it about all the wonderful changes you plan to make in your school. Share with the creature your vision for education. Ask the creature what are the first steps you should take to delivering on that vision. Now, what you've all just done, I can see some people are sleeping, which is fantastic. <laughs> Sadly, I'm not. <laughs> you've just made a promise with your creature to make a change. And perhaps more importantly, in the hustle and bustle of bet, you've taken a moment to stop and reflect. So, this gift is not your eye mask, though you're very welcome to take it home today. This gift is your creature and that special place. And when you go back to your classrooms, and perhaps you've lost sight of your bigger vision in solving all those important and urgent tasks, make time. Make time for you. Time to reflect and reconnect with your ambitions. Talk to your creature. And remember Yanis, slowly, slowly, as much as you can. Now, you might be wondering <laughs> what on earth a meditation activity has to do with Google. And quite honestly, I was asking myself that. Um, but well-being is a really important topic for educators. And nowhere is that more important than here in the UK. We know that teachers here have heavier workloads than those in other European countries and frequently suffer from workplace stress. So taking care of oneself is absolutely vital. But meditation also gives you an edge. It gives you that opportunity to stop and reflect. In addition to calming you down, often in those moments, we find ourselves coming up with the best ideas for innovation. And as I'm sure you know, innovation is at the heart of Google's DNA. We're passionate about it. And that's why we commissioned a research report to determine what were the key emerging trends in education. And we re released the report called The Future of the Classroom. We interviewed um, academic experts, we did surveys of literature, we talked to teachers globally, and through these different sources, we've identified eight global trends. Now, fortunately, 
I'm not going to share all of those trends with you today, but I am going to share with you three of those that we feel are really vital. So our first topic is that of digital responsibility. I have a soon-to-be 15-year-old child, 15 on Tuesday. Um, my primary concern is his safety online. We all want our children to be safe. And I don't need to tell you how widely social media is used by young people. The statistics speak for themselves. What's interesting, though, is how easy is it actually to control young people's behavior? A research study by Oxford University found that whether 11 to 16-year-olds access inappropriate material was more than 99.5% down to factors other than internet filters. So it's not enough just to block inappropriate content. We need to educate students around how to best navigate these important issues. We need to make them safe navigators of their digital world. Now, at Google, we take this responsibility extremely seriously. G Suite and Classroom, with its more than 90 million users globally, is fully compliant with privacy legislation, including GDPR. We don't serve advertising to any of our users, and we don't use their data for any commercial purpose. But that's the foundation. We need to do more than that. And that's why, for students, we've launched a course called Be Internet Legends. For teachers, we've provided a course curriculum that they can use in their classrooms to help teach this important topic. And for IT admins, we work to make sure that they have simple and effective controls that allow them to determine what students in the classroom experience. So, for example, if you wanted to turn Gmail off for younger age groups, you can do that at the touch of a button. So I'm going to give you a moment to read this quote from Anneli in Finland. I'm not going to read it out to you. Now, what I like about this is this notion that technology and being safe online has become a natural part of everything. That makes it sound so easy, doesn't it? But what we know is that making something natural requires us to be intentional. And so when we talked earlier about why digital technology projects fail, we have to remember there is a need to be intentional. And at Google, we want you to get the maximum impact of digital technology in your classrooms. And that's why we've worked to create a framework to help you plan intentionally for great safety and great technology in your school. And that's called the Google for Education Transformation Center. And it provides seven pillars that schools should consider when making change involving technology. The website is full of fantastic examples from around the world of other schools like yours making this change. And it's a great tool to help you build effective plans. At the heart of the model is the need to have a solid vision for why you're choosing to make the change. And of course, you've already started this. You did this with your creature a few moments ago. I'm guessing that for many of you, when you thought about that vision, it involved a desire to innovate more in your classroom. And it's not surprising that innovating pedagogy is our top trend in our report. It highlighted that teachers who have more engaged classes, that who innovate, have far more engaged classes, which we know re results in better outcomes. But sadly, the statistics around workload and stress are bleak. And of course, that's why we wanted to give you the gift of meditation at the beginning of the session. If you can meditate in the bet arena, you can do it anywhere. And whilst technology can't solve all these problems, 
teachers and experts are aligned that technology can help them be more efficient. And being more efficient gives you more time for innovation. Now, this is a word cloud um, we, create, we created asking our users, how has G Suite for Education and Chromebooks helped your school? What I love about it is that not only do we see a really high impact on teacher efficiency, but we equally see fantastic impact in areas that are linked to innovation. Words like collaboration, creativity, learning, and engagement. And when we look more anecdotally into what's actually happening in classrooms, we have some lovely examples of change. They're not all completely transformative. Remember, Yanis, what's a change for you might be quite small for someone else, but the point is that you're changing. Take Ailey, for example. She's based in the Highlands. She's 16 years old, and she's required to create a CV because she's going into job interviews. Now, sadly, Ailey's got low confidence, and when tasked with writing down what her skill sets were, she found it really quite challenging. So in Highlands, what they did was give her more creativity and scope to express herself in a way that speaks to her. And she created these visual CVs, and through that experience, became far more confident about her employment chances. At the upper end of the scale, we have schools like Agora School in the Netherlands. And this is a school that has completely transformed traditional notions of how education can happen. It puts far more autonomy back into the student, it's transformed the physical space of the classroom, and had some fantastic results. And you can find out more about these examples from the Google website. So here at Google, we're happy to share details of new products. And I know many of you come to see us to find out what's new. Um, we have two key areas of, of, uh, of launch. The first is for younger ages. We're delighted to announce a new Chromebook tab from Lenovo. Now, we know that the device is a vital part of the experience, but we also know that what you do with it is more important. And that's why at Google, we worked hard to make sure you had plenty of choices and options around what content to use on Chromebooks. So there's literally thousands of Android apps now run on Chromebook. But here at BET, to further strengthen this, we've created the Chromebook App Hub, which allows you to search from a set of curatable apps. You can search by level, subject, and in addition to that, privacy you can see which of the apps have certified themselves against legislation like GDPR. We've also included an ideas section written by teachers to help you innovate in the classroom and give you t hints and tips on how to use these apps to best effect. Finally, we're beginning to work with OEMs like Acer and Dell to help manage the management of those apps more efficiently. For example, we've heard a lot about the need to bulk purchase apps through a PO from the school, and this new service will make that possible. When it comes to G Suite and Classroom, we've added a couple of new features. Uh, the first is rubrics. Now, rubrics are designed to help you align your assignments more closely to the classroom and to help it be more transparent to students how you're assessing their work. We've also launched originality reports, which allow students to ensure they're citing references appropriately, but also for teachers to ensure that students haven't inadvertently plagiarized. Going into beta, we have the capacity to do peer-to-peer peer-to-peer -peer plagiarism within the domain. So you can see if a student is working off another student's work at your school. And we're also launching the service in Swedish, French, and Portuguese. Now, that leads us to our final topic, that of emerging technologies. And uh, it made me smile because I've been coming to BET for a long time. 
Um, I think that 15 years is probably now more like 20, sadly. Um, and one of the things that always amazes me is how much technologies that feel like they're emerging become mainstream really very, very quickly. So I put the image of VR on here because now this feels like kind of an everyday thing. So the question is, what's next? What's next on the horizon? For me, it's not one thing, and it's a hugely exciting time. It's the promise and potential of a whole body of computing, that of cloud technology, and more specifically, machine learning and AI. And it's a tool that offers great promise, but also, as in this example, for which I hope you forgive me, just a little bit of fun. So we created this app at Google with the Google Cultural Institute and in partnership with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You can go and put it on your phone. I, I urge you to do so. What it does is it uses machine learning to map your photograph to the entire portrait collection in the museum and then tell you who you most match with. Sounds like a bit of fun, right? So I was quite happy because when I did this, I actually came out as girlhood. I felt quite good about that, having come to bet for nearly 20 years. But sadly, my main match is not girlhood. It's actually Queen Victoria. <laughs> so be careful what you wish for, but do have some fun with, with this. But this is powered by machine learning and AI. Now, if you take a look at the explosion of machine learning techniques in Google products, you can see that this has skyrocketed. And the fact that this graph only goes up to 2016 is testament to just how widely this technology is embedded across all of Google products today. And there are lots of examples that you may not really be aware of that you're using already today in G Suite. Take, for example, in Gmail. How many of you have seen the Smart Compose function? This is the capability, yeah, a few of you. This is the capability to auto-complete your sentences. So you'll start to type, and then predictive text will start to finish your sentence for you. Or forms. This is phenomenal if you're a teacher. You can establish multiple choice question banks using forms, and forms will give you the incorrect answers to a question that you write. That is really driving better teacher efficiency. And please remember, this is for teachers, not for students. And lastly, sheets. Anyone notice there's a little Explore button in the right-hand side of the screen when you're using Google Sheets? What that does is allows you to ask questions of the data in normal, everyday language, like provide me a chart that shows my student results by background, and it will automatically create a table for you illustrating those results. So as a teacher, you no longer need really sophisticated data analysis tools to drive insights in how your students are performing. Now, as you're probably guessing, I'm not an expert in AI and machine learning. And sometimes I feel that in the industry, we may confuse or confound people about what machine learning and AI actually is. So I thought it might be valuable to take some steps back and just describe that. You'd be pleased to know in simple terms. So artificial intelligence is the science of making things smart, and machine learning is an element, a subcomponent of that activity. It's a technique used to develop AI. Again, you've already experienced AI and computers learning and having knowledge. Think about spam filters. How many people have had a spam email? If I don't see a whole show of hands, I know the meditation was too good and you've all dropped off and yes, okay, good. So the first spam filters were built on rules. 
If the email contained a certain word, like webcam, then it got marked as spam. And the community helped improve the product by telling the computer multiple times that that word was, in fact, associated with spam. But spammers got clever, and they learned to change simple things like one letter in the spelling of the word so that the spam got through. And as that happened, technology companies became more advanced and more nuanced. And spam firm filters learned to look at examples of undesirable emails and learn based on the content which is spam. Nowadays, we don't need to tell the computers what to look for. They figure it out. So how do machines learn? Well, there are three key types of machine learning today. The first is supervised learning, just like the example we shared in spam. When you click report spam, you are giving the computer the information to tell it that it's wrong, and through that it learns. The second is about unsupervised learning. This is about looking through data sets and discovering patterns, classifiers, and being able to categorize based on similarities in data. We can see huge advancements in the healthcare area where we're able to detect breast cancer earlier, for example, through this kind of technology. And the final one is reinforcement learning, which is far more complex, being able to string together over the long term multiple levels of learning, like almost like a game of chess. Much more challenging outcome to achieve. It's kind of not that dissimilar from the way we learn as students. So I guess some of us feel a bit afraid of artificial intelligence. It can feel a bit scary, and what will it mean? I like to cite this article because in it, Fei-Fei Li tells us that there's nothing artificial about technology. It's made by humans, intended to behave like humans, and it has to serve us. And at Google, Sundar Pichai has developed a set of guiding principles to help make sure that when we develop our products, we're doing it in the right way. So things like ensuring that we're making an impact socially, we're avoid creative, creating bias, that we're ensuring that safety is at the heart of what we do, and that we're incorporating privacy design principles are just part of that. But really, it's down to us all of us to decide how to use this technology in a most powerful way. Now, we've obviously been working on this a long time at Google, and we're often asked, what will the impact of artificial intelligence be in education? I think there are many, many ways that we're going to see artificial intelligence help you, help you as teachers. That could be in our capacity to drive better insight in how students are performing, to drive the right content and learning experience at the right time for students, to help ensure that we know those students that are really at risk, and to adapt learning to individual learners' needs, and to help to surface the right content to you and your students just at the right time. This is an example not seen before in the UK, only available in the US, of an app called Socratic that's been developed by Google. And what you can see is happening here is that a student is photographing a problem from a homework activity. And what's clever about this is though the words that are contained within that problem relate to balloons, temperature, and volume, the system doesn't return standard Google search results, which would probably give you a picture of a balloon or a temperature gauge but it's able to understand that this is actually an academic problem. It's something called Charles Law, which some of you may know already. And to deliver back appropriate, accurate, supportive content to the student on this topic. And perhaps that's been the missing link. How do we get to the right kind of content on the web when there's so much of it? So we're pretty excited about this app. As I said, not available here, not yet spoken about in Europe, um, but soon will be launched. This is just one example. So in my opinion, 
we need to decide how machine learning will benefit us. And I include you in that process. It has the capacity to help you be more efficient. It helps you see which students need extra help and when they need it. It's going to help you be more efficient and schedule your day better. The potential of it is tremendous. But I urge you to know that it's you that will make it impactful. And you're at the heart of how we think about it when we develop our products. So I'm going to leave you with my creature and my special pace. Um, this fox came to visit me um, just after New Year, and he was curled up under the maple tree in my garden. And he was obviously pretty proud because he wanted me to get a really good shot of him. So this is my fox, this is my garden, this is my special place. Um, I urge you to remember your promise to your creature and leave Bet with steps in place to make a change in your school. And if you're feeling overwhelmed at times, take a moment. Remember Yanis, slowly, slowly, as much as you can. And of course, you've always got your eye mask. Thank you so much. Thank you to Liz Sprout. That is the end of the morning here in the main arena. We will, in five minutes' time, be setting up for the EdTech 50 session. Please do stick around for that. Um, in the meantime, of course, there is the rest of the show to see, and we will be back in five minutes. Thank you.